hello you're welcome to my channel now in this video you want to find the aging values and the aging function of this given differential equation y double prime plus lambda times y equal to zero and the following boundary conditions y evaluated at zero is zero and y prime evaluated at l is zero given that l is bigger than zero okay so as these are the boundary conditions they are just the values of the function at the end point in the certain interval so they starting from point zero to point l where l could be any number okay great maybe you may be given a special case where l is equal to one so in place of l in this solution you just be using one but l is a general case anyway so we are given here that lambda should be bigger than or equal to zero well, this lambda, okay, it can be any real number, but in this particular case, if lambda is less than zero, all right, the value there will give us um, a trivial solution, and as such, lambda will not be an aging value of this problem. So like we've solved in our first two examples, we've seen the pattern that this kind of stuff follows. Okay, so there is no point considering the negative case in this case, all right? Okay, great. In fact, we consider this as case 1 and case 2. Case 1 when lambda is equal to 0 and case 2 when lambda is bigger than 0. Now, in this particular example, lambda equals to 0 will still not be an aging value. That is to say, it's going to give us a trivial solution. So maybe we just do away with it. Okay, let's just look at it, all right? And we'll look at the case where lambda is bigger than 0. All right, so let's just put it down as case 1 and then case 2 when we are done with case 1. Okay, so we look at this function, y double prime plus lambda y equal to zero. Okay, great. Now maybe let's just rewrite it. When lambda is equal to zero, this equation will be reduced to y double prime plus, now in place of lambda, we just plug in zero. This will be in y double prime plus zero, all right? Okay, so we equate that to zero, since that will just give us the left-hand side the same thing. Okay. Great. Now, given, looking at this, we can change this into a its characteristic equation, all right, in terms of R, like we've always done. We will have it to be, let me just use the black, that R squared is zero. So this gives us that R can be zero, okay? Those are the two values we get from the R. R1 can be zero and R2 can be zero. And in this case, we are having real roots, but they are um, equal roots. So since the equal roots are actually zero, we assume a solution of this form y of x to be c1 plus c2x. All right? Okay, so in solving this kind of second order linear differential equation, we assume this kind of solution for it, the arbitrary constant, and since this is a repeated root, all right, and it is actually zero, so this is what we get as our assumption. Okay. And now, since we've had our y, right, we need to plug in these uh, boundaries. Okay, so we have y evaluated at zero will be zero. So maybe in place of x, we just plug in zero right there. We have it to be. Now, in place of x over here, we will see that we are going to plug in zero, and we are left with only c1. Okay, great. And another thing is to consider is y prime evaluated at L. So to actually get y prime, we have to differentiate this equation over here, all right? And I put it down as asterisk for you. So by differentiating that y prime evaluated at x, we are going to have just C2. Okay, so you just differentiate this, you get back the C2, given that you, you differentiated it with respect to x. Okay, so since the derivative is giving us C2, we have to evaluate it at the point L on the interval. We are going to have Y prime evaluated at L. And now you look. The derivative is giving us a constant function. So a constant function evaluated at any point on the X axis, given that the point is L, will still give us C2 as a result. Okay, great, because this is actually independent of X. And now we see that this Y prime evaluated at point L Okay, in the boundary condition, we had it to be equal to zero. And again, this y evaluated at zero, from the boundary condition, we still had it to be equal to zero. So this shows you that c1, which is from y evaluated at zero, is zero, and y prime of l, which is from y prime of l, 
y prime evaluated at L is still zero, that makes the C2 to be zero. That alone tells you that C1 and C2 are, are equal to zero. So since the arbitrary constant are both zero, this gives us a non a trivial solution. This gives us a trivial solution. That means that lambda equal to zero is not an aging value from the definition we had in our very first video. So that tells us that lambda equals to zero is not an aging value of this problem. Okay, so what we need to do is to do away with lambda equals to zero and look at the case where lambda is greater than zero. So that is actually going to make up the case number two. Okay, so when lambda is bigger than zero, so we go back to the original equation, we consider it when lambda is bigger than zero, we will have the same thing, it will not reduce to any form, okay, um, this is equal to zero, because lambda is not zero, so this will not be zero like in this case. So at this point, we need to move the, we write this in a characteristic equation form, given that the right hand side is zero, right, we are going to have, let's put it in terms of R, I love using R. You can use any letter that you want, all right? Like M, but do not use Y. <laughs> do not use Y. You're going to have a confusion, a mixed up somewhere. So this is going to be R squared plus lambda is zero. Okay, so as always, we get these values of R. That is the roots of this equation. Those are the R1 and R2. So doing that, since this is positive, move it to the right hand side, that will become negative, all right? You take the square root of both sides. So taking the square of a negative number, when you move it to the right hand side, you're going to have a complex result. So this leaves us with positive and negative i times square root of lambda as the values of r. That is, r1 is i root lambda and r2 is negative i root lambda. So this is a complex conjugate in that the real part here is zero the real part is zero, but the imaginary part we have positive and here we have negative of it. Okay, so since this is the case, the kind of solution we assume will be of the form y of x equals c1, then the cosine of the square root of lambda x, right? Maybe we just put this down to indicate. Then we add it with c2, then sine of, okay, uh, square root of lambda x. So, noting that C1 and C2 are now the arbitrary constants. Now, like we solved, as we solved for the arbitrary constants here, using the boundaries, okay, the boundary conditions, is the same thing we'll be doing over here, all right? So, we need to look at Y evaluated at zero and the Y, the derivative. Okay, so since it's simple to just plug in zero into here, in place of X, and equate the whole thing to zero, we will just do that real quick. We're gonna have Y evaluated at zero to be, now, in place of x on the right hand side, since we've just plugged in zero for x here in the argument, okay, or in the independent variable position, we just do the same thing to the right hand side. You observe that when x here is zero, we are going to have cosine of zero, all right, which is going to give us just one. So c1 times one is going to be c1. Then we do the same thing over here. We're going to have zero as an output. Okay, so that means y evaluated at zero is C1. And y evaluated at zero is equal to zero, so we equate that C1 to zero. Great. So that means that our first um, arbitrary constant, C1, is zero. Now, to get, to look at the second arbitrary constant, which is actually C2, to see if it is going to give us zero, in other words, if you are going to have a, another trivial solution, or it's gonna give us something different. Let's consider the second condition from the boundary conditions that y prime evaluated at L should be zero. So we need to differentiate this y, okay? So by differentiating this here, that will give us the y prime of x, we are going to have, so you just go ahead and differentiate this right hand side. Here we're having a function of functions, and, and that, that's all. So we are gonna have square root of lambda, then, we open a bracket and consider C2 cosine of square root of lambda x. Then we have it with negative of C1 um, sine of square root of lambda x. Okay, great. So we no notice this and notice that. So again, when you differentiate this, you're going to have 
negative cos negative sine of that all right which is here then this square of lambda from function of function is to come out the same thing is also applicable to that so just apply your techniques of differentiation and you will see this okay great now y prime evaluated at point l so you just have to in place of x here we plug in l all right and we equate everything to zero so maybe let's just do it up there so we are going to if plug in l in place of x and equate this to zero so that would mean that we're going to have square root of lambda all right then Observe, I don't want to write a long stuff. So you observe that C1 is zero already. That will kill the whole of this term, right? That will break it down to zero. So we are only left with this one. So we put the square root of lambda times C2 cosine of square root of lambda times x, right? We equate that to zero. So again, y prime evaluated at x is the whole of that. C1 is 0, so this term will be will get to 0 because um, 0 times whatever is here is going to be 0. So we are only left with this stuff. Now, y prime evaluated at point L, so in place of x, we plug in L, okay? So sorry, this is going to be L, but we will write it. And we had it to be equal to 0, so that's why I'm equating that to 0. Okay, and now, already we know that the first arbitrary constant is zero so if the second arbitrary constant is still going to be zero we are going to have a trivial case and we always try to avoid that on, unless we can't even avoid that at all we just allow it happened like in the first case it just happened all right now this second case lambda is bigger than zero so the square root of lambda cannot be zero all right this is it so the square root of lambda is not zero no matter what because lambda is bigger than zero Again, C2, like I said, we should be careful with it. Now, we have another term over here, cosine of the whole of that. That can actually be zero because that one contains the aging value. If at all, we will not have a trivial solution. So C2, we do not allow it to be zero, as always, that we do not want a trivial solution. So the only possibility here is this cosine of square root of lambda times L should be the zero. Okay. So our interest is in finding the angle in which when we say cosine of that angle, the result will give us zero. So which kind of angle whose cosine will be zero? Well, if we talk about pi over two, that is cosine 90 degrees, all right? Cosine of 90 degrees are actually equal to zero. Same thing with the cosine of 270 degrees. In fact, cosine of odd multiples of pi will give, sorry, cosine of odd multiples of pi over two will give us zero. So when we are talking about odd multiples of pi over two, we can actually do this here to be, let's write an odd stuff. Let's say two, let me bring it down a little bit. Two n minus one of pi over two. So by looking at that, we are talking about odd multiples of pi over two. So two n minus one will always give us an odd number for all integers n running from one towards the right, all right? In fact, let me do this. I brought that thing over there. So we are saying where n is bigger than or equal to one. So we are considering integers here. So this will always give us an odd number, all right? So cosine of an odd, an odd multiple of pi over two will always give us zero, like cosine three pi over two. 3 pi over 2, cosine 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, and so on, like that. Even the negatives. But in this case, we want to consider the positive cases of the positive integers because of our aging value. Anyway, okay, great. So we notice that n is bigger than or equal to 1. All right, let me just clean it off. And now, since we have this to be the case for pi, we can actually solve for since we have this to be the case for lambda we can actually solve for lambda by dividing both sides by l and taking and squaring both sides we'll have that lambda is equal to 2n minus 1 squared pi squared over 4l squared so you just look at it divide both sides by l and take the square of both sides okay great and now we observe here that if 
n is going to be 1, all right? We will have um, 1 minus 1, okay? 2 minus 1, which will be squared, all right? So we take our n to be big, bigger than or equal to 1. That is integers bigger than or equal to 1. Maybe I just put it down here that n is an integer like that. So that right there is our aging value, given that it is any term of a sequence where n is bigger than or equal to 1. So we can go ahead and get the corresponding aging function. That will be by observing here that c1 is 0. So you get to your y of x, plug in 0 for c1, it will kill the whole of this. This is the remaining, this is what you use to get your aging function by, in place of this lambda, square root of lambda, you plug in lambda and take the square root of it, then you multiply with L, that right there gives you your aging function. Maybe let's just do that and we are done with this. Okay, so in order to get the aging function, we have y of x to be equal to, now, c1 is zero, so we, like I said, we look at all the values of our, of our arbitrary constant, c2 is not zero, though it is not specified, um, but c1 is zero, so it will kill everything here. We are just gonna have c2 times sine of, and now, square root of lambda. So lambda is the whole of that, all of them squared, all right? So we take the square root of the whole of that, and we multiply that with x, we are going to have 2n minus one, then um, pi over 4l, uh, L4 is the same thing as 4L, but maybe let, let's just rewrite it though. 4L, and then we multiply that with X. That right there is the corresponding aging function. And now, just multiplying this by a non zero multiple, a non zero constant multiple, all right, it still retains the same property as not even multiplying it at all. So this is still um, an aging value corresponding to the lambda. Okay. Okay, this is just pi. All right, so that gives us the aging function of that problem. It's not actually one, though, because n is bigger than or equal to one. So there are infinitely many, all right, as long as we have many integers bigger than or equal to one. So there are infinitely many of them. So we, when we have n equals to one here, that, is, that will be the first, that will be lambda one, that is the first aging value. We just substitute the one here and evaluate. We get that. We come in here and substitute. We get the corresponding aging function. N gets to two. You substitute, you get the aging value. You get the corresponding aging function where N is two and so on like that. So there'll be infinitely many of them. But when our lambda is less than zero, we will have a trivial solution. And when it is equal to zero, we also have a trivial solution. But as long as it is equal to zero, we have as many aging values as possible. So we see that lambda can actually affect the solution to us our problem.